I'm Mewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And I am so excited for the show. I know I say this frequently, but I am smarter after reading our current guest book. And that always gets me really excited. So Dr. Moya McTeer is an astrophysicist. She's a folklorist and she's a science communicator. She's going to explain all of this to us. She is the host of the Exelor podcast, which if you are not listening to it, yes, I'm plugging someone else's show. <laughs> it's so good. And also the co-host of Fate and Fabled, which is part of the PBS Digital Story series, which is pretty fun as well. So we're going to cover all of this. There's also The Milky Way, her new book. Like I said, we're going to cover all of this. But I have to ask first, Dr. McTeer, Dr. McTeer, when do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Mima, first of all, thanks for having me here. Um, I sleep a lot. I think that I, it seems like I do a lot because it's a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I do the same amount of work that a person with a nine to five job would do. I just don't have one job. I have like many part-time jobs. I try to be strategic about all of it so that I can double up on the work. Mm -hmm. um, I started writing this book, The Milky Way, when I was in grad school, getting mm -hmm. a PhD in astronomy, studying galaxies. So it made sense to write a book about galaxies so I didn't have to do double duty. How do you tailor a book like this? A book that, pardon me, contains the entire universe. <laughs> How do you tailor it for the layperson? I spend most of my time as a science communicator mm -hmm. talking to laypeople. Right. I have honed my skills of taking complex concepts and boiling them down, not dumbing them down at mm -hmm. all, but boiling them down into their most important parts and then translating them into language that the layperson can understand. So this is this is my job. And the fun part about this book was getting to do it from a perspective that wasn't mine because mm -hmm. I'm usually explaining things as Moya. And in this book, I got to explain things as the Milky Way, which was a whole different exercise because the Milky Way has different references that it would use. It's coming from a, a different starting point. And also it doesn't really understand what it's like to be human. It doesn't know what the average human knows. So that, that was the tricky part, trying to take the skills that I have as human science communicator Moya and giving those skills to the Milky Way. When did you decide to do this though and write the Milky Way as an autobiography? Was it as you were setting out to, to create the book or was it... Mm -hmm oh, I started the book and now I'm going to step back for a second and figure out how I want to do this. No, it was from the beginning. Okay. I was very lucky in that I was approached by a literary agent. Mm -hmm. um, I had given a talk in June of 2019 about Juneteenth, and it was this really interesting talk that explained the history of slavery in the context of astronomical events. Like for the more than a century of, se of slavery in the U.S., Here's how far the galaxy moved. Here's how far a photon could have moved. Here's how much mass the Earth gained, because the Earth is gaining mass from cosmic dust every single day. And someone that Jeff, my agent, represents, saw that talk, told him about me, and then he reached out. Um, and so from the very beginning, when Jeff and I met to talk about book ideas, we landed on writing a book about the galaxy and then I didn't want to write it from my perspective. I, I thought, who am I to be adding to this list of awesome popular science astronomy books? Mm -hmm. What can my voice add to it? Not much. I mean, like, yes, I, I have a unique perspective, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that different from astronomers that have come before me. The Milky Way, though, has a very different perspective. And it was this confluence of things. At the same time, I was reading The Raven Tower by Anne Leckie, which is written from the perspective of a sentient rock god character. Mm -hmm. And it just all fit together. And I remember being really nervous, actually, to tell my agent, Jeff, that I wanted to write it from this perspective. I went to an open mic at Caveat on the Lower East Side of uh, Manhattan, and just tried it out. I was like, hey, audience, I am going to tell you like a list of chapters that I'm thinking of writing in this upcoming book. Let me know what you think. And it was well received. And my agent didn't laugh at me. And so I just I just rolled with it. I'm going to quote your opening of the book. And the first line is, take a look around you, human. What do you see? And then you follow it with, 
you'll start naming objects and places, but that chair you're sitting in isn't just a chair. That book you're holding isn't just a book. Even the planet your kind is on the brink of ruining isn't just a planet. They're all me. Every single thing. Mm -hmm. We are part of the galaxy. Uh, you know, and there are so many quotes that touch on this. Mm -hmm. Carl Sagan's uh, We Are All Made of Star Stuff, the we are the universe trying to understand itself. Like it's it's true. Um, we the the elements that make up our body, all of the carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, those were formed in stars. Um, we are literally stardust. And so is the chair that you're sitting on or the book that you're reading, because it's all the same stuff. But also measuring time is really important. I mean, 200,000 years ago, humans showed up. But when you're talking about the Milky Way and when the Milky Way is talking about itself, you're talking in terms of billions of years. And mm -hmm. that too, I mean, perspective, you're putting a lot of context into something, you know, we look up and we think, oh, that's lovely. That's pretty. Or if you're in a city like we are, we don't necessarily get to see the stars because of light pollution. But yeah, can we just talk about that scale and how you actually communicate that kind of scale of time? Yeah. Time and space, because mm -hmm. the universe is big uh, along all of these dimensions. And that's what I really wanted to do with this book was get people's mind expanded as much as possible. I think that that's one of the great benefits of studying astronomy, at least the way that I have studied astronomy. Mm -hmm. I have this mental map of the galaxy. Like in, when I close my eyes and, and everything goes dark, I can picture the swirling disk of the Milky Way in my head. I can picture where our solar system sits within that big system. And I can even picture how the Milky Way sits within the larger galaxy. I think that's really useful because it gets me out of my stupid little human brain for a while and gets me thinking about how I am a small part of a larger whole. And um, what I do doesn't matter on, on the grand scale of things but it matters so much to everyone around me because I know how unlikely it is that we all manage to be here at the same time in the same place. Okay, but one of the things you say in the book too <laughs> is seeing isn't the only way to gather information. And you and I have been talking, it, we started this conversation about what you see and how you mm -hmm. see, but seeing isn't the only way to gather information. How do you study a black hole if you can't see it, Dr. McTeer? Yeah. That's that's one way mm -hmm. in, in which mm -hmm. seeing is not helpful in astronomy. Uh, black holes are these gravity pits. They're super dense objects that have so much gravitational attraction that light photons cannot escape them. They If they try, they just get bent back in towards the black hole. So we can't see them, but we can see the influence that they have on everything around them. I think of it kind of like wind. Uh, you know, that Katy Perry song, do you ever feel like a plastic bag just drifting through the wind? Well, you can't see the wind, but you know that it's there and you mm -hmm. know how it's behaving because of the way the plastic bag moves. Mm -hmm. The black hole is the wind and all of the stars and gas and dust around it. That's the plastic bag. We can see how stars move. And when they're around something very massive, like a black hole, then they start to move faster. Uh, so we can actually measure like, the mass of the black hole just by measuring the speeds of stars around it. And you also come out and say another thing that sort of made me sit and think for a second. Gravity is the galaxy's most valuable tool. I mean, I think of gravity as the thing that keeps me seated. I think of gravity, mm -hmm. force equals mass times acceleration. Like I, that's literally the only thing I remember from high school physics. And that's plenty. Uh, well, you know, it's vaguely useful, but at the same time, gravity. Can we talk about, because I don't think of gravity in terms of outer space. Really? I don't. Well, you know, I that, think of, you know, Neil sense. Armstrong bouncing along the surface of the moon. I've seen that footage. I've seen those photos. But I don't think of gravity as something that's happening outside of where we are. And that speaks more to me as a words person than a book person. <laughs> I mean, and a book person than a science person. But I think it actually speaks to the way that we talk about gravity. Mm -hmm. the, the term zero gravity, mm -hmm. um, we say astronauts on the International Space Station are experiencing zero G. They're experiencing microgravity because uh, there is still gravity out in space. Otherwise, our planet would be flung out into the universe. Mm -hmm. There's gravity keeping us around the sun. 
there is even gravity keeping our entire solar system inside the Milky Way. So yeah, there's there's gravity everywhere. Um, but the the whole gravity is the is the tool of a galaxy thing. I needed to anthropomorphize the galaxy, and so I needed to assign it some agency. But I also needed that to be rooted in the science, because otherwise this would not be an effective science communication vehicle. Um, and I have heard over and over again through my studies that gravity is is king, or I think I say in the book, gravity is king or queen, because <laughs> uh, gender doesn't matter to galaxies. And it's true. All of the motion in the universe is because of gravity. The fact that stars form uh, is because gravity can pull all of those particles of gas and dust together. The fact that orbits happen, it's because of gravity. So if you anthropomorphize a galaxy and assign it some agency, it needs to be able to do things. And we see that gravity does things. I didn't know that you grew up in a log cabin in the woods of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. No running water. Near the West Virginia border, no running water. Did you have electricity? I know you didn't have a television, but... We had electricity. Okay. We had Wi-Fi because both of my parents were adjunct English professors. So we, we needed the internet, but not running water. This is a really tough way to grow up. You're not wrong. At one point in the book, you say, I started talking to the sun and the moon as if they were my celestial parents, because that just made sense. And no one else was doing it, but it made sense to me. So I want to talk about you getting grounded as a tiny person and figuring out that here's this big, giant world. I mean, I'm not a woods person. I'm really mm -hmm. not a woods person. I'm a city person. I like the desert, <laughs> but I'm a city person. And I will own that. And I have spent time in the woods and I'm okay. Y'all can have the woods. Yeah. But I want to talk about you getting grounded in story and narrative and, and how you can push things forward and basically create a world. Hmm. That's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> mm -hmm, I know. So imagine you're this little girl who grew up in a city and then you were transplanted to the middle of the woods where no one for miles looked like you. No one really understood where you were coming from. And so you spend most of your time alone. That was me. I spent most of my time alone uh, going on adventures in the woods or reading and because I didn't have other people to play with, I imagined things. And I read stories and I came up with my own stories and I started to see how these stories could give me companions um, and how you can make companions out of, out of anything or anyone um, if you are creative enough. And so that, that just kind of stuck with me for my entire life, a love of stories and how they can transform people's minds and like lived experiences. Do you remember the book that made you think, oh, I'm a reader. I want more of this. I want story. I want, I want this. I mean, do you remember how old you were and do you remember what it was? My entire life has been full of books. My mm -hmm. mom was studying for her comps. She was in a PhD program in English when she had me. So my earliest memories are her reading me the books that she was studying from. Um, <laughs> yeah, like reading little like newborn Moya, um, Milton and Shakespeare and, um, and Thoreau. So I've always been a big book nerd. Mm -hmm. That's why I was so excited to be on the Barnes and mm -hmm. Noble podcast. It was one of my, like, it was one of my favorite places to go when I was a kid. My mom used to read me this bedtime story called the paper bag princess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was about this, this princess, she was betrothed to a prince that she didn't really like. And a dragon comes to attack her kingdom, steals the prince away, and then she goes to save him, but her clothes are burned. So she's wearing a paper bag. And when she finally saves the prince, he like turns her away because she's not dressed fancy enough. And I think that was pivotal mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of my like, oh, you know, like screw expectations. You are the only person who's graduated from Harvard with uh, degrees in astrophysics and mythology. Mm -hmm. And it shows up throughout the book, but very specifically in chapter four, creation. That's a big gods versus science chapter, modern myths mm. in chapter seven. You have always sort of put together the pieces as you see them needing to be put together. What does world building look like to you as a science writer? 
I have a very broad definition Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. both science and world building. Okay. To me, science is the rigorous attempt at understanding the world around you. Mm -hmm. And most people think that that means you're in a lab wearing a coat, working with test tubes. But I think that that's just a matter of using the scientific method in your everyday life. It's Mm -hmm. a matter of observing the world around you and being curious enough to ask questions and having the the logic skills and yeah, some, some math and science skills to find the answers to those questions. But it goes beyond physics and chemistry. It goes beyond math. It goes beyond psychology and sociology, the social sciences. I think that folklore is a type of science. Um, I think that the myths that we've been telling since the dawn of humanity were humankind's first attempts at understanding the world around them, which is exactly what I think science is. And they just didn't have the benefit of all the accumulated knowledge that we have now in 2022. My very broad definition of world building is that it's any speculative exercise where you're imagining what could happen if if X condition were met. Uh, I think that we can use this in, in fiction, obviously, making uh, fun fantasy or sci-fi worlds, but we can use it in policy creation. Um, Legislators are using world building all the time when they imagine what the world would be like if a certain bill were placed or or not. Interior designers, makeup artists, I think that anyone who is trying to intentionally craft a space or an atmosphere or, or set a movement in motion, I think that's all world building. And because... I'm going to bring it all together now because I have broad definitions for both of these. I think that when you're doing your world building in any aspect of your life, it's helpful to use science, this rigorous attempt at understanding how the world works to make a richer, more realistic world. You have a great line. Actually, this is from chapter seven, modern myths. And you say myths are stories that you capital B believe in, even if you know some or all of it to be false. What does truth mean anyway when it butts up against a narrative that you've folded into your identity? And voice to me, I mean, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction or memoir or essay, it doesn't matter what you're writing. It doesn't, a piece of legislation is voice, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, a scientific paper, an academic paper, it's all voice. I mean, yeah, it, it fits within a certain structure, obviously. I mean, there are formal rules to writing a scientific paper that don't apply to writing an essay that's going to run in X, Y, but it ultimately comes back to voice. And part of what I love about the work that you do and the fact that you are working in different media, I mean, video is not the same as podcasting is not the same as the written word on the page is not the same as speaking. All of those are very different forms of storytelling. So ultimately, everything you're doing comes back to story and your voice, which I really appreciate. But who are some of the other literary influences that have gotten us to this point? I mean, you're not just scratching out scientific papers for a specific (laughs) audience. I mean, you're going bigger. You're going broader. I mean, you're writing your scripts for um, the PBS digital series, which I'm so sorry. I just blanked on the title of Oh, it's called Fate and Fabled. Thank yeah, you. I, and Fabled. I get to write and host, mm-hmm. which is really exciting because um, I started out hosting episodes that someone else had written mm-hmm. and it just feels totally different to be reading and presenting your own words. Are you a linear writer or do yeah. you just sort of jot as you go and then sort of reassemble? No, no. Okay. Thank you for asking. I wrote from the beginning to the end of okay. this book. Uh, <laughs> I, I tried to jump around. There were times when I got stuck. Um, in the crush chapter, for example, mm-hmm. where the Milky Way is talking about its epic romance with the Andromeda <laughs> Galaxy. And I got so stuck, but I refused to move on to a different chapter. And everyone around me was like, Moya, just just write the next chapter. Like, it's a myth chapter. It'll be a nice change of pace. I was like, no, I have to write from beginning to end. This is what, 216 pages. Mm-hmm. You cover a lot of ground and you cover a lot of conceptual work and a lot of scientific theory and it's all kind of fun and poppy. But for you as astrophysicist, Mm -hmm. what's, what's sort of the great mystery that you're poking at and trying to figure out next? For me Mm -hmm. personally, it's gotta be aliens. Okay. It has to be. My 
dissertation in grad school mm-hmm. was titled why are we here constraining <laughs> the milky way's galactic habitable zone I, I opened up with this little uh story about four scientists getting together for a meal and discussing this question why are mm-hmm. we here but they're each placing emphasis on a different word so the philosopher is asking why are we here what's our purpose and uh the biologist is asking why are we here like what what is it about our bodies and the astronomer is asking no 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 the real question is why are we here in this place and Mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. okay and that's really what I want to know I applied to grad school with that question in mind I had heard about circumstellar habitable zones or Goldilocks zones the place around a star Mm -hmm. where life might form but I hadn't heard about that same concept on the scale of galaxies. And I just, I really wanted to know that. So I did. That's what I went to grad school for. I figured it out. I'm still waiting for the ultimate conclusion of that. Because mm-hmm. my my research was figuring out where in the galaxy we think the conditions are right for human-like life. Mm-hmm. And I just want to know if we're right. <laughs> I think that it'd be really cool to understand what dark matter is made of. And it'd be totally rad if we knew what dark energy was and and we could predict the eventual outcome of the universe. That'd be nice. But for me, I will not be happy until I know if there are aliens and what they're like. Okay. Would you explain what dark matter is for folks who've not yet read The Milky Way? I can try okay. <laughs> as much as any astronomer can try. Essentially, it is a type of matter that is very unlike the matter that we are made up of because it doesn't interact with light. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't absorb light. Light just seems to pass right through it. But we know that it's there because of its gravitational behavior, kind of similar to black holes, although they are, they are not the same. Black holes are just so dense that light can't escape, but they are still made of regular matter. We call it baryonic matter, like you and me. Um, Dark matter is made up of something different, and there are a lot of hypotheses for what it could be. Uh, Different particles or different um, behaviors of of the nature of matter, but it's a big mystery. And when, when I say big mystery, I mean big because of all of the matter in the universe, we think that 80% of it is this dark matter that we can't see, that we can't point a telescope at. All we can do to learn about dark matter is examine the, the gravitational influence that it has and try to run experiments where we try to create particles and see if they behave like dark matter. That's what we're doing to figure out what dark matter is made of. It's frustrating <laughs> that we don't know because it's like, it's kind of embarrassing for astronomers, right? Like here is something that makes up 25% of the universe, 80% of all of the, the matter, all of the gravitational attracting stuff is dark matter. And we don't know what it is. And then it's even more embarrassing that we don't know what dark energy is. This stuff makes up like 70% of the universe. And we know even less about dark energy than we do about dark matter. So... Riches. It's an embarrassment of riches. I know it's frustrating for you, but it's really fun to listen to you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing. I mean, I'm still thinking about this little girl in the woods who's like, hmm, I like the night sky. I'm a little bit, <laughs> you describe yourself as a weird kid, which. Oh, I was. Okay. But I mean, TM, here you are. Capital D, <laughs> capital okay. W, capital K. So here you are. In the woods, yeah, your mom is reading you Shakespeare and Milton and all of these things, and you end up taking what, on the surface, I mean, mythology and science, and you explained it beautifully how the two come together. So we don't need to go back there in the second. I'm just really appreciating the idea that you made your own path entirely. You made a thing that just did not exist until you said, (laughs) oh, I think I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. (laughs) Thank you. I think I have always lived a life of contradictions, Um, a life of refusing to choose between one thing or another. I'm a very both and type of person. I think that's pretty great. But I want to talk about your show for a second because it has a very great tagline, fact-based fictional world building. And I've listened to a couple of episodes and I have to say I will be binge, binge listening to the rest of them. But this idea 
where you sit in conversation and literally, sometimes it's a scientist, sometimes it's another creative, sometimes, I, you know, you just do this sort of, and again, it comes back to this idea that story is the thing that connects everything. Mm -hmm. It's what we understand implicitly. Dark matter, dark energy, gravity, I under <laughs> those connect us too. But really, ultimately, it's story. So can we talk about where you're hoping to take the show and what you're hoping to do and maybe explain a little bit more about your show to some folks who are listening? Yeah, of course. It's called Exolore, which is actually a portmanteau of exoplanet and folklore. Just smashing those together because that's what I did with my interests. And I am using this show to explore all facets of fictional world building. Um, sometimes it means building a world from scratch to see like in real time, how do you build a world? And I try to follow these six steps that I have come up with for how to build a world the way nature does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it starts with the, the physical world. That's what forms first out in space. And then that world has climate. It has an environment on it. Life forms. It evolves in that environment. So it's adapted to it. And then culture forms based on biological needs and what you have available in your environment. So I go through that process. Um, but I don't just want to show people how to build worlds. I, I also want to give them the tools to do it. Um, and that's writing tools. So I just did an episode um, interviewing someone who came up with a software program to help novel writers. Sometimes it's the it's the information. That's a tool. So I did an episode about how to build a culture from scratch and like, what is a culture? Um, and I think that it's important as a world builder to be able to analyze other worlds that other people have built uh, so that you know what you like from those worlds and what you don't. And also to like, see what's been done so that you know what, what else there is still to explore. What's next for you to explore? I'm developing a TV show. Oh, my. OK, can we talk about it or is it too early in the process? I think we can talk about it. No one's told me I can't. OK. <laughs> um, it is a science comedy show. Mm -hmm. The format is is loose and vague. We're still in the development period. So we are open to working with a network to really nail down the final details of the show. But the general idea we have so far is that it's a New York City apartment building full of celebrity tenants. And I am the science super. So anytime they have a ridiculous science question, like Kate Winslet's small hadron collider is broken or um, what is it? Lizzo's flute is broken. And I need to teach her the, the science of acoustics to, to get her a new one before her concert starts in an hour. Uh, and over the course of the episode, I explained the topic and we have fun shenanigans with the celebrity and I think it'd be just a blast to make that show. That sounds great. I would totally watch. I would totally, totally watch that. Your real world, too, included quite a lot of love for the night sky, which, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you and I live in cities now, so we don't mm -hmm. really get to see the sky. But when you do get to see the stars in the sky, and I don't mean a planetarium, I mean the actual like standing under the sky at night. Mm -hmm. What do you think of first? What do you see? I think of how much of a shame it is that what we can see is a tiny, inaccurate version of what is actually out there. Mm -hmm. I know that all of the stars that we can see are actually the rarities in space the most common type of star we call it an m dwarf star mm -hmm. they are too dim for us to see any of them like we aren't seeing any m dwarfs when we look up at the sky with our own unaided eyes and we can't see the dust and the gas we can't see the 3d nature of it we have these constellations that we 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 lump these stars together because they look like they're near each other in reality there's depth in space, mm -hmm. a star, all of the stars in the Orion constellation, they're, they're so far away from each other. Um, so that's, that's what I think of. And I, I usually think of it in terms of like numbers. I am the worst person to go stargazing with because I can literally only identify one constellation and it's Orion, which is why that was the example <laughs> I used. But I, I still do love the night sky. 
But I think going back to what we were saying earlier about how everything is stardust, the chair Mm -hmm. you're sitting on, the book you're holding, I realized lately that I have internalized that message and I now see everything as a part of nature. Uh, Sometimes people ask me if I miss trees because I live in Manhattan and there aren't a lot of trees. And I do try to get to Central Park as often as I can, but like the concrete skyscraper is a part of nature Mm -hmm. in the same Mm -hmm. way that I am and in the same way that a car is and in the same way that a flower is. Like it's all recycled stardust. Um, So I have gotten into the mindset of like, just feeling connected to the whole world around me. And regardless of whether it's city or country or nature, accepting that that is a a natural part of the whole. I've asked sort of who you were as a child reader, but who are you as a reader now? I've had a lot of trouble reading lately, actually. I think since the pandemic, Mm -hmm. I have had trouble sitting down and focusing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And especially because I started writing this book I, I got the book deal a week before lockdown. Oh, so this entire okay. project has been kind of a pandemic project. And mm-hmm. I didn't want to read books that would influence my writing style oh, and tone. Because yeah. I spent so long trying to craft the voice for the Milky mm-hmm. Way. I didn't mm-hmm. want it to be influenced. But I read a lot of fantasy books. Right now I'm reading A House of Sky and Breath. It's part of the Crescent City series yep. by Sarah J. Mass. Um, I have a book called Vagina Obscura on my on my TBR pile. Um, I'm like a giant <laughs> TBR oh, pile right yeah. now. Um, a book <laughs> about rain by uh, Cynthia Barnett, I think. Um, so many. I'm trying to get more into nonfiction because mm-hmm. before, I'd say before 2019, I had not read like any nonfiction. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So really your world building was exactly that it was Mm -hmm. truly truly fictional oh that's so interesting to me because I do again like I think journalists build worlds and world building to me is not a pejorative in any way shape or form it's a writer's job it is first and foremost your job to pull us into whatever you're trying to tell us and I mean I just want to be told a really good story that's (laughs) what I'm looking for and sometimes it's going to horrify me and sometimes it's going to be great and sometimes I've learned that maybe I should just listen to the audiobook because if the author's narrating it, especially if it's narrative nonfiction, I'm less likely to get enraged. <laughs> mm, <laughs> because good the, to know. the author is very calm about what the story they're telling you. I'm like, you're so much calmer than I was when I read this the first <laughs> time. But okay. What do you want readers to know about the Milky Way and what you've been trying to do in terms of being a science communicator? Because I think that's a really original phrase. Thank you. Science communicator? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's a growing thing. I think mm-hmm. the first person I saw using that title was Allie Ward, who hosts the Ologies podcast. In terms of the book Milky Way, I think that I would like people to know that the hardest part about this book was pretending to be an omniscient being when I am not at all omniscient. <laughs> I had to pretend to know what dark matter is, but like, ha ha, I'm just not telling you stupid humans. It was, that was really hard. Um, And I also was so terrified at different points in the book that I would say from the Milky Way's perspective that humans haven't figured something out, but, but that I was wrong and and I just hadn't found that paper yet. So that was, that was the hardest part. (laughs) Something that I just want you to know about the Milky Way, like the galaxy is that it is, it is there for you. Um, you do not have to be a scientist. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to have a lot of money to appreciate and even study the night sky. Um, there are, are websites like um, Zooniverse where you can get involved in these citizen science projects. Citizen amateur astronomers have discovered exoplanets. They have discovered galaxies. So the Milky Way is for you to play with and, and do what you want with it. Don't don't let it seem like space is just something that billionaires can access. It seems like a really, really great place to end this episode. Dr. Moya McTeer, thank you so much for joining us on Port Over. The Milky Way is out now. Thank you so much. This has been a blast. 
Hello, and welcome to another TBR Top Off, where we recommend books for you to pick up when you come in for your copy of The Milky Way. I'm Becky. And I'm Mark. (laughs) And we are coming to you from our home store in Cincinnati, Ohio. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Absolutely. Go for it. Awesome. So the book I have for you is called How I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming (laughs) by Mike Brown. (laughs) So good. Um, So if you are of a certain age, basically, if you were in elementary school, finished elementary school before 2005, you were taught about a solar system that had nine planets. And then in 2005, we lost one of them. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, what happened uh mike brown was uh is an astronomer and he was looking searching for other planets in that solar system uh and he found uh he discovered a 10th planet um that he called eris and um and he found that this planet was just slightly larger than pluto well Rather than everyone then just expanding the solar system to 10 planets, there was basically an agreement that, oh, well, you know what? Eris isn't that big and neither is Pluto. And so therefore, we're just going to cut them both off. <laughs> and oh. uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, I just was a little heartbroken yeah. when we lost Pluto. Yeah. Uh, and, and for Mike Brown, it was. Uh, he was so excited to have discovered <laughs> this new planet, and he actually discovered a few other, uh, you know, kind of smaller planets over there. And 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 he was so excited for like this discovery and to share it with the world. And what ended up happening by he, the decisions that were that were made, he ended up getting like hate mail from elementary school kids Aww. because you know <laughs> because we lost Pluto. Uh, so with Pluto's demotion, uh, Mike Brown, his life changed drastically. And so this is his story of basically covering both, you know, kind of what led to the discovery, all of the, you know, the years of research, um, but then also the aftermath of, of what happened when, uh, yeah, when, when Pluto was demoted and, uh, and we got stuck with only eight planets. Uh, I know. Um, it's really informative and fun, as you can probably tell from the title. But um, anyway, when you get a chance, please pick up How I Killed Pluto and Why I've Had It Coming by Mike Brown. Mark, what do you have? Oh, <laughs> what a great pick. That sounds so delightful. And let's just all have a moment of silence for Pluto. Okay, moment over. <laughs> so I chose a fun book as well. Um, I picked a book by Michio Kaku, who is a theoretical physicist. Mm. He's written a ton of stuff. Uh, but the book that I chose is Physics of the Impossible. Um, this is a really interesting look at things like destructive laser beams, telepathy, teleportation, uh, force fields, and how those could be plausible. Um, The book is broken up into three sections or sort of degrees of probability, Um, starting with the most foreseeable things like artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, invisibility. I'm not going to try to explain the science behind that, (laughs) but it could very easily happen Um, to the very impossible, like seeing the future. Um, He uses uh, hard science to posit ways in which these phenomena could occur. Uh, through time, through future breakthroughs in science and technology. Um, And if you think, you know, 100 years ago, things like television, the atomic bomb, social media, those were all considered impossible. Uh, So who knows what could happen uh, in our future? Um, He is just an entertaining character in general. Um, If you ever get a chance to watch any sort of interview with him, he is so delightful. Uh, but certainly check out his books, starting with Physics of the Impossible. It's so much fun. And I don't know about you, but I am ready for superpowers. So bring them on. Yes. yes. I mean, an invisibility uh, ability? Or yeah. Like, so we're saying like the invisibility cloak that, you know, of Harry Potter is... is it is it could happen. It's a real thing. It could maybe? easily happen. <laughs> I love and that. And will. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, apparently it's just a few years away. Yeah. So that's fantastic. I love it. Um, Well, that's all that we have for you today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, Please rate and subscribe when you get a chance so that you never miss an episode. 
Um, you can follow Barnes & Noble at Barnes & Noble. Pretty easy. <laughs> it's simple enough. Simple. And you can follow us at our home store at BN Westchester. Um, I'm Becky. And I'm Mark. And we hope that you have a wonderful day and yeah. enjoy reading. Happy reading, everybody. Bye. Bye. Pour It Over is a Barnes & Noble production. The show is available on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.